Hello, David Diga Hernandez here. Welcome to Spirit Church. Today, you're going to be blessed. I'm talking about finances. I believe this is your season, your time, your moment for a financial breakthrough in your life, in your life, in your ministry, in your business. The message today is from frustration to fruitfulness. And I'm gonna be talking about the three biblical keys to moving from the frustration of lack into the fruitfulness of God's provision. God's will for you is prosperity. God's will for you is blessing. And we're gonna look at the three keys to getting there. The first, Stephen Moctezuma is gonna lead us in some worship. Creating me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Creating me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Oh, we can sing, creating me again. Creating me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me, oh create. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. And cast me not away from thy presence, oh Lord. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. And cast me not, and cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord. Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. the Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And renew a right spirit within me. And renew a right spirit within me. I think it's important that you recognize the importance of finance. You know, the scripture talks a lot about money, and I'm going to talk to you about money today. And I used to apologize for having these types of conversations because I didn't want to be labeled as a certain uh, type of evangelist or, you know, uh, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, prosperity type preacher. And really, I'm not one of those types of preachers. But we do have to acknowledge that the scripture addresses money. The scripture addresses finances. The scripture addresses blessing and it addresses lack and it addresses prosperity and it addresses poverty. Really, poverty cannot be God's will. Poverty causes starvation. Poverty causes disease. Poverty causes death. Poverty causes depression. Poverty causes discouragement. How can that be God's will? How can poverty be God's will when everything we see in heaven is reflective of who God is? In heaven, there is abundance. In fact, there is so much abundance in heaven that you walk on gold. There is so much abundance in heaven that everything that was created is for our pleasure. And if that's how it is in heaven, there's feasting and there's abundance and there's joy and there's peace and there's provision. And Jesus said, pray that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's everything that there is in heaven, everything as it is up there, so it should be down here. Poverty cannot be the will of God. Poverty is not a godly trait. Poverty is not something that God will give you as a reward necessarily. Now, Paul the Apostle did say, I've learned how to live abased and I've learned how to live in abundance. I've learned how to abase and to abound. In other words, he's lived in poverty and he's lived in abundance. But poverty itself 
in and of itself is not necessarily godly. And we need to move away from that type of thinking. And instead of putting out a message, a whole defense on why um, prosperity is God's will. I mean, I've written articles on this on my blog and I've written several papers on it. But that's a different message for a different time. I want to talk to those who already know in their heart after reading the word that prosperity is God's will. And I'm not saying that everybody is going to be super rich and have a gigantic house that you can see on television where they come and feature your home. I'm not saying that everyone's going to have um, this tremendous wealth that you see in the the 1% type of the United States. But I do believe that God wants to give to each of us enough to provide for our needs and more so that we can be a blessing to others. That to me is prosperity. To have my needs met, to have provision met, and more. Abundantly, above all we can ask or think. Overflow. It's in the nature of God. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, the scripture says this, and it's such a powerful verse. This is what the Bible says. It says, The blessing of the Lord makes a person rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. You see, in the world, when you obtain riches and prosperity, in an ungodly way. Really, riches obtained in an ungodly manner can never be considered prosperity because prosperity is a wholeness. Prosperity has to do with every aspect of your life. So if I obtain riches in an ungodly way, in a deceitful way, in an ill-mannered way, then it cannot be prosperity because it's not from God, because it's not godly, because it wasn't rooted in the character and the nature of Christ. So anything that is received outside of the character and nature of Christ can never truly be counted as prosperity. But you have to realize that it is God's will to prosper you. It is God's will to bless you. You need to be convinced of that. God wants to bless you. This is the reality. This is the truth. You want to be blessed, and God wants to bless you. So how do you move from the frustration of poverty and lack, the frustration of being unable to do things, to the fruitfulness of prosperity? Because really, when you have an overflow, you can fund the church. When you have an overflow, you can fund ministries and orphanage projects and missionaries. I mean, I can go on and on. I mean, everybody wants to be in that place, and God wants you to be there. You want to be at the place where your needs are met, where your family is taken care of, where you can bless your family, you can bless others, and you can bless the kingdom. That's not a bad thing to want. In fact, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says that where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Money is a good gauge for your heart. Now listen, listen, this is important. Money is a good gauge for your heart. Why? Because it's so necessary. You say, well, preachers, all you ever talk about is money. And some people might be offended that I'm talking about money on this video. I, I don't imagine that this video, on average, because of comparing it to the average Spirit Church videos, I don't imagine this video is going to be even over an hour. We say I would be wrong for talking about this for 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour. Yet you work for money almost eight hours a day. Money itself is not wrong. Let me tell you why people don't like people talking about money. People don't like people talking about money because it touches at the very heart of the issue. It's easy to say, praise God, I'm a Christian. Praise God, I'm with you. Praise God, I believe. But when you demonstrate it with your finances, then you're really in. Then there's really sacrifice. Then you're really giving of your time. You're giving of your resources. You're giving of the effort that it took to acquire the finances that you have. When you sow into the ministry, when you sow into the gospel, you're not just giving paper. You're giving your hard work. You're giving your effort. You're giving your skill. You're giving your time. You're giving what will cause you to have provision. You're giving what could be used to buy food, to buy shelter, to buy clothes, to buy things that your family needs, to buy things that your business needs, to buy things that that your ministry needs. And so this is why Jesus talked about it, because it touches right on the heart of the issue. People don't like when we talk about sin, but I talk about sin. People don't like when we talk about money, but I talk about money because you need to hear it. And really, the ones who get offended that you talk about money are the non-givers anyway. The people who say, oh, you shouldn't talk about that, they're the ones who aren't going to give. They're the ones who are, are in the back saying, well, let me just kind of give as I, you know, just kind of off of whim. And there's no discipline in their giving. There's no sacrifice in their giving. And at the same time, there's no blessing on their life because they're not giving to the gospel. They're broke and they criticize the preachers for talking about money. I mean, think about the prophet Elijah who asked the widow for all that she had left. I mean, my goodness, how audacious of the prophet to do so. 
Yet it was the instruction of God because God touches at the very issue. God touches in this in the place where it requires our faith, where it requires sacrifice, where it requires us to step out into the unknown with uncertainty, fully trusting in his word. That's where he meets your need. So I'm going to talk about money. And I'm not going to apologize for talking about money. This is something that the body of Christ needs to hear. I mean, think about this. The world is funding their agenda. I mean, you think about all the false religions. You think about the evil political agendas. You think about the evil cultural agendas. They all have people backing and funding. Where's the church? When are we going to show up and start supporting what we believe in? When you support a ministry, when you support the gospel, when you support the kingdom, you are sowing into the gospel and you are causing the message that transforms lives and hearts to propagate around the world. So you want to move from frustration to fruitfulness. You want to move from lack or maybe you're in a good place and you want breakthrough. You want to go to a different level. I'm going to show you how to do it. Faith is the bridge between frustration and fruitfulness. I'm going to say that again. I want you to let it settle in your heart. Faith is the bridge between frustration and fruitfulness. So you shouldn't be ashamed to ask God for things. You may say, well, there are so many other more important needs out there in the world. Well, God's not broke. God doesn't have lack. God doesn't have to take from someone else to give to you. In fact, when God gives to you, you're able to provide for the needs of others out there. When you're in a position of provision, when you're in a position of prosperity, you can do more for the kingdom than you can in poverty. And that's the truth. So I'm going to share my experience. It's my story. I'm not ashamed of what God's done in my life. Um, you look at this ministry, it's fruitful. We're doing worldwide television, international events. We have global discipleship programs such as this spirit church that you see. We have people on staff. Um, I'm a full-time evangelist. That's because of our partners, our donors, our supporters that know that everything, every penny that comes into this ministry goes to the spreading of the gospel, goes to touch lives all around the world, and they know that their gift is leveraged. But it didn't start that way. I want to tell you a story here. I began in ministry when I was around, oh, I must have been around 10, 11 years old is when I first really began to serve in the church. I still remember to this day, I was standing in the Sunday school room in my church. I was, I was eating uh, one of those, uh, what are those breads called? Those, like that Mexican bread. I mean, I'm Hispanic, I should know. You don't know either, do you? Uh, you don't know, you don't know. So, so I was eating this bread, and I remember me and my friends were there, and I saw Pastor Eddie Vargas. Many of you have heard me talk about him before. He's a spiritual father to me. He helped to mentor me from the time I was a kid to a preteen to a teen to a young adult. Even to this day, he's helped me. And some of you have read about him in uh, different writings of mine. But Eddie Vargas was very key. And he was one of uh, my dad's key guys in the church. He was one of the, the Bible study leaders in the church at the time. He was also the head of the worship. And this was back in the day when, and you'll remember this, this is back in the day when we had, um, what was the, it was overhead projectors to where you put the slide in not the digital computers that you see. I mean, we're talking, this was back then. I mean, it's amazing how far technology has come, but we used to do the overhead projector. And I remember I was uh, s sitting there with my, or standing there with my friends, and Pastor Eddie Vargas comes into the room, and he's looking around the room, and he's, he's doing this jolting glance back and forth. And I knew from the moment that I saw that look on his face, I thought, this guy wants something. He's looking for someone to do a favor for him. Well, it wasn't just me who caught this uh, note on Pastor Eddie's face, but the two friends of mine beside me also caught this note on Pastor Eddie's face. They realized he was looking for some help. So he turns and he says, I need a favor. My friend on the left went over to my left. My friend on my right went over to my right. And they were both gone and left me standing there. And I was eating the bread. I couldn't say no because I was chewing. And I felt like I was... It was like honed in on me. I was like a deer in headlights, just captured in the moment. I had no escape from it. Pastor Eddie looked at me and says, I need you to run the overhead projector. Now, you have to understand that me, 
I'm the type of person that needs details. I want to know. So I'm, I, I'm already thinking, okay, well, how do I do this? Do I flip the song in just seconds after they begin to sing that verse, or do I flip it in seconds before they begin singing the verse? If I bring it in before, am I going to cause them to sing the song before it's too early to sing the song? If I bring it in too late, I'm going to cause the whole worship to be thrown off. I'm already spinning these things in my mind. I have all these questions. I want it done perfectly, just right. I need all these details. doesn't matter. It's minutes to spare. He says, here's the, the list. Here's the songs. Flip them as we go. And I said, oh, no. I'm going to mess this up. I did okay. I was fine. But that day, that's the day I became a TV evangelist. You see, everything that I have right now in the ministry, God gives favor. God gives blessing. God gives responsibility as you're good with what you have. If you're a good steward over what you have right now, God will bless you with more. Number one, the first key is stewardship. And I remember finding that place of stewardship. In fact, you remember the parable of the talents? The scripture says that a man went away on a long journey and he gives a certain amount to each individual. And the first two individuals that received their amount had doubled their amount after he had been away on a long journey. He says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He says, I'm going to give you more. And he gave to each of those first two more. But the third servant who had one a bag of silver or however the amount was interpreted. He only had one of what they had several of. And he says, Lord, I was afraid. I hid it in the ground. And the master says, couldn't you have done something? Couldn't you have put it in the bank to collect interest? You should have done something with what I had given you. He says, you're a wicked and lazy servant. Then he takes from that servant and he gives to the ones with more. And then he says, the ones who have will be given more. And the ones who have little, that will be taken from them too and given to the ones with more. Talk about opposite of what politics say today. I mean, today we say take from the rich, spread it out among the poor, but that's not the biblical way. That's not how God does it. The reason people have much is because they're good stewards of what God has given them. And so this was my first ministry. My first ministry was, it, it was flipping songs on an overhead projector. And I remember I got so good at that, I took pride in what I did. I remember I had the timing down just right. I had all the songs lined up. If, they be, if the worship team were to spontaneously go into another song, I knew in my filing cabinet exactly where that song was. I have it up within seconds. I, I, I gave my all to that. And then we graduated to newer technology. We got the laptops and the projectors, and now I was pushing a button. But I made sure that I pushed that button on time every time. In fact, I went through all of the slides, and I corrected all the grammar, all the spelling. I made sure that it was just a few sentences per slide and not a whole chapter, so you're looking for the words while you're singing the song. It helped to uh, create that worship environment where people could focus on the Lord more. And I said, I'm going to do my best with what I've got, and I gave my all to being the projector guy. That's all I did. And I did that for like three years before I preached my first sermon. Now, I was a steward, and again, I'm just sharing you my, I'm not bragging, I'm sharing my story with you. I'm hoping it'll inspire you. I was a steward of what God had given me. I gave my all. I went to the worship practices to make sure I had my timing right on the song. And I gave God my all. I said, Lord, as I do this, I'm doing it unto you. And it was from there that God brought me to a different place. So number one, good stewardship. You have to get practical. Okay, so you're talking about blessings. You're talking about the supernatural. There are many people praying, Lord, take me out of debt. Lord, help bless my finances. Yet your spending is way off. You're asking God to bless you. And you're not managing your finances well. You have more than you think you do. You're actually more blessed than you think you are. But you're not managing the resources right. You're, you're, and again, I know this is not everyone. Some of you do manage well. But I'm making the point to those of you who you know this is convicting you. I'm talking to you. You're asking God for a blessing, yet you mismanage. Yet you buy things on credit that you don't need to buy on credit. I'm, I mean, that's just a little tip right there. I don't want to get too practical in the finances, but we're going to keep this as spiritual as possible. So... When you're a good steward of what you have, you're cooperating with God's supernatural desire to bless you. When you're a good steward of what you have, you're cooperating with God's supernatural desire to bless you. So some of us are saying, Lord, bless me, and he blesses you, but because of your bad spending habits, because you're not a good steward of what you have, you take all of the blessings that God has given you, and you've consumed it upon your lust. In fact, the scripture says you have not 
because you ask not. And you have not because when you do ask, you ask amiss because you ask to receive it and just consume it upon your lust. He says, so you, you don't have because you're not asking. And if you're asking, you're asking in a way that's more beneficial to you. And you're just going to take what God gives you and spend it on everything that you want to do. You're drilling a hole in the boat. It's like you got a drill gun and you're drilling all these holes saying, Lord, keep my boat afloat. And you're drilling holes in it. You're causing it to sink while asking him to save it. We talk, we talk about taking care of what you have. You say, Lord, I want a new car. Do you take care of the one you have? You say, Lord, I want a new house. Do you take care of the house you have? You say, Lord, I want nice things. Do you take care of the things that you have now? Lord, I need a job promotion. How well do you do the job you have now? Do you show up on time? Do you take too long of a lunch break? Do you log more hours than you actually use? How are you treating what you have right now? Are you a good steward of what God has given you? We can't expect more if we cannot obey with the little that we have. Here's what stewardship is. Stewardship is taking care of what you have. Stewardship is doing what you're supposed to do with what you have. Stewardship is treating what you have like it's what you want. I'm going to say that again. Steward is, stewardship is treating what you have like it's what you want. When you can give on what you have now, it's a sign to God that you're ready for more. If you're holding back, you're saying, Lord, bless my finance. Again, we say, Lord, bless me and I'll sow. God says, sow and I'll bless you. If you can't sow out of the little that you have now, you're not going to do it when you have more. When you sow out of what you have right now, it's a sign to God that you're ready for more. So number one, it's good stewardship. Can God trust you with abundance? I want you to really ask yourself that. Don't say yes right away just to be spiritual. Ask yourself right now, can God trust me with abundance? Take a moment, think about it. Can He? The answer to that question You'll know that by whether or not you give out of need. Can God trust you with abundance? Well, the question is, do you give now? Do you support the gospel now? Are you a good steward? Do you manage it well? Do you manage the money right? You see, we get tired, we get bored, we get used to our surroundings. I could have got bored as, as the projector guy for three years, but for three years I did not lose the passion because I did it as under the Lord, because it was the ministry that He gave to me. And I valued that so much. And I said, Lord, even if it's just the projector, you gave this to me. I get to do this for you. You serve first. And then God raises you. God exalts the humble. He lowers the proud. He resists the proud. And He gives grace. He enables the humble. So number one is stewardship. Number two is generosity. Fear grips, love releases. Luke chapter 6, verse 38 says, Give and it shall be given. Pressed down, running over, shaken together, shall men pour into your bosom so much so that you won't be able to contain it. But the scripture says, Give and it shall be given, not it shall be given so you can give. The initiation is on us. I mean, you think of scriptures like James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. It's on you. The ball is in your court. God has left the initiation on us now. He's given His Son. He's let His Son die on the cross. He, he sacrificed violently His Son. Now it's on us to respond to everything that He's done if we want to receive everything that He has promised. So I'm all for the practical, but the practical isn't supernatural. So you could be so tight with your money. You could be so well financed. I mean, I know people who, they just hang on to money like it's their life. And here's the truth. If you hang on to money tighter than you hang on to your faith in God, it's an idol. That's why Jesus said you can't serve both God and money. You're either going to serve one and hate the other or vice versa. You cannot serve both God and mammon, the spirit that tells you to grip your finances. I'm talking to someone right now. You grip your finances and you don't let it go. Even if it's in your hand to do it, you hang on to it. I remember a story that a friend of mine had told me. His son uh, was turning, I think, seven or eight. You know, just, he, was, he was a young kid and he took his son to downtown Disney. And at downtown Disney, there's this big store. It's a toy store. It's a Lego store. And 
Legos, as you know, is, this, is a toy that's uh, building blocks, and they're just these tiny little pieces that make up these amazing, um, really, they're like pieces of art. And so this boy goes into the, the Lego store with his dad, and his dad takes him there, and there's this section where kids can play with Legos before they go and buy their set. Now, you know, if, if you've ever bought Legos before, maybe I, I, I'm going to buy some for my nephews, and, you know, they're, they're quite expensive, or they can get expensive. So there was a particular set that he had wanted. I forgot what the theme was, but there was a particular theme, a particular set. He's, he was telling his dad, Dad, that's the set I want. I want to grab that set, and I want to go home with that. And he said, okay, we're going to get that set for you. And the son is playing on the table, and he's got all these little Legos, and he's playing. And so finally, he sees on the shelf, the dad does, he sees on the shelf the set that his son wanted. The problem was there was only one left. And he says, look, son, it's the set that you want. He says, go get it. So his son gets real excited. He sees it. He runs toward the shelf. He looks at the set. He turns around and runs back toward his dad. He goes, what are you doing, son? Go, go grab the Lego set. Go, it's right there. Just grab it. I'll get it for you. And his son runs up to the set, comes right back, and he's really sad and discouraged. His dad says, son, what are you doing? you got to go grab it. And finally, this time, he did it a couple more times, and he says, son, why are you not grabbing it? And his son looks up at his dad, and he holds out his hands. He opens his hands, and he's got Legos little Legos in his hand. He didn't want to grab the set because he didn't want to let go of what was in his hand. What was on the shelf was much more than what was in his hand, but he couldn't get it because he was afraid of losing with what, what he had. And that's some of you. You're such a, you're a good steward. You have that in place. Some of us were reversed. I mean, there's two different types of personalities. There's the cerebral and there's the creative. The creative types are the more, you know, they're the ones who, they're going to give generously, but they're also very impulsive buyers, so it's hard for them to be a good steward. On the flip side, they're those who really rigid, really good with their money, but they lack the generosity because they're more, they're relying more on their ability to manage the money than they are the generosity of God, and they can't quite compute, how is me giving going to give back? How is me giving going to be good stewardship of my finances? And so there's either side, and maybe that's you. Maybe you are a good steward. Maybe you have things in order, but you grip your money so tightly that you're not generous and you can't give to the gospel. Neither extreme is healthy. We need both it's good stewardship and supernatural generosity if we're going to move forward. So I remember there was a time in my life where God had called me to do more television ministry and this was on this is before we were on international television we were just on a local cable station if you remember those days you actually helped film for us uh, when we first launched encounter tv and the cameras we had then were nowhere near in fact i think all three of the cameras and all of the old equipment was equal to the price of one camera that we have here now i mean that was it was an older set i think the camera i think total of my equipment was like fourteen thousand dollars of everything that i had but TV equipment to a TV preacher is like a church building to a pastor. It was important. It was the basis of our resource and ministry. It's how we got out promos. It's how we got out our teaching. It's how we got to teach people. It's how we got to reach the world, even though it was only on internet and cable te uh, local cable television. I think it was like 60,000 homes at the time. And I remember the Lord spoke to me so clearly because I said, Lord, we're ready to go to the next level. We have an opportunity to do international television. We just need better equipment. Once we get the better equipment, we can start broadcasting to millions of homes as opposed to just 60,000. And I'll never forget what the Lord told me. He says, okay, son, here's what I want you to do. He spoke it so clearly, and, and, and to this day, I'm so glad that I listened to him. But he spoke very clearly. He said, son, I want you to give away all your camera equipment. At the time, I said, that can't be the Lord. That's got to be the other guy. That's, that can't be. And I was fighting it, and I was resisting it because... I was holding on tightly. It was everything that, it wasn't practical to give away. Because had I given away the equipment, there was no guarantee we were getting new ones. And it had taken me three years to do the fundraising to get that $14,000 worth of equipment. Three years to raise $14,000. That was the start that we had. And that, so it tells you things were pretty rough. And I said, Lord, I can't let this go. But the Lord, you know when his hand rests on you and he speaks, his hand will weigh heavy on you. And eventually I said, okay, this is the Lord. And I'm going to do what he told me to do. And I started giving away all the equipment, but I held on to a couple cameras. Nothing happened. And I felt like Saul, who had done everything the Lord had told him to, but he held on to a few for his own benefit. And I said, Lord, can I just hang on to this just in case the Lord, the Lord told me, so everything you have. And I gave away the last camera, and I remember I had no camera equipment. And I said, okay, Lord, you got to do your thing now. I trust you. Within a month, 
almost $100,000 came in to help us buy our new equipment and build a brand new TV studio. And that was the last set before this one that we had built that we were on for a couple of years. And now we're in this even newer set, a new phase on even more homes. But you see, I had to let go of what I had to make room for more and what God wanted to give me. That's generosity. So generosity releases the flow of God's provision in your life. Take note of that. Generosity releases the flow of God's provision in your life. Prosperity is a river, not a reservoir. We treat God's prosperity like it's a reservoir where we save and we collect, but that's not how it works. It's got to be a constant flow. It's not about hanging on. Prosperity isn't gripping. It's taking from the Lord and passing on. Taking from the Lord and passing on. You receive, that's where you're blessed. You give, that's where you're a good steward. That's where generosity takes place. So, Without generosity, the stewardship of your finances requires no faith. Without faith, how can your financial management be pleasing to God? It takes faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Your, the way you handle your finances cannot be pleasing to God unless it requires faith. And if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't require faith. I know people who tip God. I've seen offerings where people throw like two cents in the offering. God bless them if that's what their heart was. But my goodness, the offering envelope costs more than two cents. So they end up costing the ministry money by throwing in two pennies. And some people, I'm, I, I'm not talking about the people who that's all they have. I'm talking about the people who that's all they have in their pocket. When they have thousands in the bank, they'll just kind of tip God. Here, I'm doing God a favor. It's because they don't think big. They think small. They think, oh, this is, they think it's just like every other ministry. That, oh, just a little street down the ministry down the corner. They may think of your ministry that way. And those are the small-minded people who never step into the provision of God. But the people who can see big, the people who can capture a vision, they become generous because they realize they're attaching themselves to something that's bigger than themselves. They're attaching them to something, themselves to something that's global, that's worldwide, that's of the divine, that's going to change the course of history. They know that, and they dig deep, and they dig with faith, and they sow. If it doesn't hurt, it doesn't work. It does not take faith to tip God. See, for me, at this point in my life, I could sow $100, maybe $200, maybe 1000 and it won't really require that much faith from me. But if God told me, I want you to sow 5000 10000 into a ministry, I'd say, oh, goodness. Now, see, that's going to require some faith to release that. That's going to hurt. God will test you on the level you are. And until you pass that test, he's not going to take you to the next level. You've been stuck in the same place either because of stewardship, and that's where the frustration comes. Frustration comes because you don't know what to do. Frustration comes because you feel like your back is up against the wall, like you've tried everything. But good stewardship and generosity are the bridges in faith from frustration to fruitfulness. And you may say, Lord, but I mean, I know I have friends who they can sow 10000 like it's nothing. I mean, they sow it like I would sow $100. And they're very wealthy men. And they tell me, you know what? When God tells me to sow even bigger, like when they sow the 30, the 50,000, they say that's when it hurts them. And I, have, I had a friend who was telling me, he said, God told him to sow 10,000. He said, Lord, why don't you get someone else to do it? And God told him, fine, I'll bless someone else like I blessed you. He says, no, Lord, I'll do it. You see, we want the blessing, but we don't want the responsibility that comes attached to that blessing. Are you holding up? your responsibility for the blessing that God has given you right now? Are you saying, Lord, what I have, I'm being responsible and obedient? If you're not obedient with what you have right now through generosity, you're not going to be able to receive what God has for you. And it takes faith. It takes generosity to go there. So if it doesn't hurt, it doesn't take faith. If it doesn't take faith, it doesn't please God. So you want God to touch your finances, but you won't let your finances touch Him. Be the blessing. See, we're always praying, God, send that check in the mail. You go to the mailbox hoping that someone, you hear these stories, right? Oh, I was, you hear people say stuff like, oh, I was believing God for this amount of money. And a check randomly came in the mail, mysteriously, wasn't expecting it. And you go, where do these checks come from? How do they get it? Who are the people sending these? And then you pray, Lord, send me a check. Yet when was the last time you randomly just sent a check to bless someone? You need to be the blessing that you're praying someone will be to you. And that will release the flow of God's generosity in your life. It will release them. It'll unstop the blockage. Send that check in the mail, that random check 
you're always hoping to find to someone else. So generosity is key. Number one, stewardship. Take care of what you have and obey with what you have. Number two, be generous. Don't hold so tightly. Trust God. Do we believe the Bible or not? See, if I were to tell you, if I were to sit in a room and have, if I held a $100 bill in, your, in my hand and say, hey, if you give me $10, I'll give you this $100. Likely, if you know me, you'd say, okay, and you'd do it. Yet God says something very similar. He says, bless me, bless my church, bless my people. See if I won't pour out a blessing. I'm going to cause it to come back to you overflowing. And we go, well, I don't know about that. We trust man more than we trust God. We trust money more than we trust God. That's the heart of the issue. That's why people get so offended when you talk about this, because that's the reality. They're defensive because they're convicted and they know in their heart they're clinging too tightly to their finances and they love their money too much. So I'm here as the man of God, the evangelist, to say, hey, let me shake you out of that complacency. Let me get in your face with the word. I love you enough to tell you the truth, and this is the truth. If you're holding too tightly to your finances, that's what's, un that's what's stopping the blessing of God in your life. Number one, it's either bad stewardship or you're not being generous. And then there's the third key. Faithfulness. The scripture says that the, the master went away for a long time. He went on a long journey. That means the three men who received of him had a long time to double the efforts that they had been given. So let's say there's a train. You ever, I mean, trains are powerful pieces of machinery that go very fast for their size. But it takes a while for that train to gain that momentum. It takes a while for the train to get going. What were to happen if the train, when it started to go, were to stop and then start to go, then stop? That's the problem. We keep having to start over because we keep quitting. Faithfulness, okay, I'll put it to you this way. People will sow sporadically for weeks, months, and years. They'll give once in a while, so here and there, they're hit and miss, hit and miss, hit and miss. They're giving, but they're hit and miss, hit and miss, hit and miss for years. And they call that faithfulness. That's not faithfulness. Faithfulness is consistently being a good steward and consistently being generous over a long period of time. If it's missing good stewardship, if it's missing generosity, if one of those two is sporadic over that period of time, it cannot be faithfulness. It's just doing those things sporadically unfaithfully over a long period of time. If you're hit and miss with your giving, you're an unfaithful giver. If you're hit and miss with your stewardship, you're an unfaithful steward. If you're faithful and consistent with those two over a long period of time, you're faithful. Faithfulness doesn't happen in weeks, months, or years. I've had people who've come alongside this ministry over the years and they quit within years because they don't understand the principles of favor. They can't, they don't, they're not faithful long enough to acquire the faithfulness on their life. They're not faithful enough to, to acquire the favor of God on their life. And, and they miss out on the blessing. I've seen people in churches do that. I've seen people, they start sowing for a few months and go, ah, I see it doesn't work, and then they stop. And I tell them, well, it took you years, years to dig yourself into the hole you're in. You expect God to do it in weeks? He can do it, but he wants to test you first. He's not going to bless you with abundance unless he can trust you. So don't start and stop. Be persistent. So where's your heart? Is it faithfully in the work of God? I'm going to close with this. There are three levels of giving. First of all, there's the gift of giving, which is Romans chapter 12, verse 8. I'm not talking about that. There's giving out of duty, which is a great demonstration of stewardship. There's giving out of a need, which is a great demonstration of generosity. But if you give out of duty, eventually it becomes tiring. If you give out of need, eventually it becomes taxing. The third and greatest level of giving is giving out of love. Because when you give out of love, you're a good steward and you're a great, greatly generous person. When you give out of love, you're both a good steward and you're generous. And you can do it faithfully because it's love that fuels you. And love goes above and beyond. Think about this. My sins are forgiven. My heart is filled with peace and joy. I want others to experience the same. In your hands, Jesus, I place my trust. I place my finances. We say, God, I want to give you my life. And that's not consistent if you don't give them your finances. Here's my challenge to you. 
Start tithing to your local church. Start giving to the work and the ministry. Even if you don't see the return right away, be faithful. Even if it's going to cost you, be generous. Even if it's hard to be disciplined, be a good steward. Here's the altar call. Normally I pray at the end, but here's your challenge now. I pray that God would bless you. I pray that God would release His abundance on you. But the key that unlocks that favor, that causes the floodgates of blessings to open up your life, is faith. Faith causes you to step from the natural into the supernatural power of God. You can step out today by sowing into this ministry. You can step out today by saying, God, I'm going to give of myself. I'm going to give of what I can. I'm going to sow, and then I'm going to start sowing consistently. Spirit Church, I'm talking to you. Partners, I thank you for your, your faithful giving. I'm talking to Spirit Church members who have yet to start giving, and I'm talking to people who, who receive from this ministry. You can do something. Help me take the gospel around the world. Help me continue to do what God wants us to do. We want to expand this to even more. We have a ministry facility that we're investing in toward the future. We're going to move into this thing and we're going to do more than ever before. We're going to be able to do larger events than ever before. We're going to be able to influence more people than ever before. You're going to be on the ground floor of this ministry. I believe this ministry can become one of the most influential in the entire world. And you can help us get there. All to the glory of Jesus. And it's already on track for that. You can see the favor of God on this ministry. Come under it. Receive from that favor for yourself. Connect yourself with it. Receive from the favor of God. I walk in the provision of God. I walk in the blessing of God. When I ask for finances, I can't, I mean, I, I can tell you honestly, my personal needs are met above and beyond. I don't need to take much from the ministry because I have resources outside of the ministry. God blessed me with a business mind and I use that. The people on our staff, are taken care of by our ministry partners and they work 24 seven to get the gospel out there. The events that we do, the television broadcast we do, this that we do, all supported by donors and partners. I challenge you, step out now in faith. I'm believing God for a thousand new partners within the year to come alongside this ministry and say, I'll give $30 a month. I'm also believing that there are a couple people watching. God spoke to your heart. It's in the thousands. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna say it because I don't wanna manipulate. But God spoke to you, and you know in your heart what it is. Go and do it today. Well, that's it for this edition of Spirit Church. I want you to write to me now. Write to me, email me, let me know you're watching. Let me pray with you. When you, e when you join Spirit Church, there's a link if you're watching this on our website. If you're watching this in the app, you won't see the link. You've got to go to spiritchurchonline.com. But if you're on the website watching this right now, You'll see a link that says Join Spirit Church. You join that, you're going to get a, month, a weekly email from me personally. I send it out personally and I respond to all of those personally. Send me your prayer request. Join the Spirit family. Join with us in touching the world with the gospel. That is it for this edition of Spirit Church. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.